which is uh, conducting maintenance and troubleshooting activities. Um, Jim presented on Monday, part one on commissioning, and gave a lot of great information. Uh, we're going to handle a lot of questions as well, so uh, we'll have the same format this evening. Give Jim the uh, controls here in just a second, and then uh, he's going to be monitoring the chat window. So as you have items you'd like him to address, please type them into the chat window, and he is very good about uh, uh, addressing those items. Um, also, uh, we have had some updates to the answer key on the mechanical design question that are posted in the forum. If you haven't registered for the forum, there's a lot of great information out there from students as well as us. Uh, you need to just go in, register, and put your uh, social media, either Facebook, Twitter, um, or, or something along those lines, to register into the forum. But there's uh, a lot of good information out there and some updates. Uh, we will also be having a session tomorrow night on kind of uh, you know, test taking strategies, uh, also kind of pulling in some pieces that we, as we've gone through these different content domains, some regard, in some areas we've dived into certain topics in great detail, and then within that content domain, uh, maybe not had time within these sessions to address everything. So Richard's putting together a presentation for tomorrow night, and then I'll go over some test taking strategies that just basically pull together some of these loose ends, things you think you need to know about. And um, also tomorrow, uh, look for an email, perhaps on an invitation to a dive into the NEC codebook, a highlighted uh, codebook, which I know was a session on that already, but just another kind of highlight of that uh, that will happen sometime tomorrow. So uh, all this is everything we do is recorded. So if you're hearing this now and that doesn't fit in for you, you can always check back. So I'll be out there in the newsletter and you can do it. Uh, log in and, and take advantage of any of this. So um, we have with us this evening uh, Jim Dunlop, who most people know as the author of The Real Bible in Solar, the photovoltaic systems book that first came out in 2004, had a second revision in 2010. And um, what I love about this book is there are other textbooks out there that kind of tell you what to do to design systems and kind of walk you through the process. But I know when I was learning, I had that book and uh, didn't explain why. And it wasn't until I got this Jim Dunlop textbook that I finally really understood all the background information that you need to know to be able to understand why solar works the way it does in so many different areas. So uh, it really is uh, widely recognized, um, and, and Jim as well has taught solar classes for years. Um, many of you may have attended a class that Jim taught. Um, he's worked extensively with the Florida Solar Energy Center, who has been a pioneer in solar research and development engineering, as well as education for the last 20, 30 years. And so uh, Jim brings a wealth of knowledge and experience on a topic that is exactly what is required. Because until you are with this technology long enough to see something break or need to be maintained, uh, having to deal with those problems in the real world is what, uh, you know, Jim has just an incredible amount of experience in. So we get the best dive into this knowledge set at the end as well as the experience. And so with that, uh, we'll turn it over to you and um, we'll start here now. And uh, it's about five after five and we'll go right till six o'clock. Okay, thanks. It's uh, mountain time. So wherever you are, just the hour. But it's five after the hour. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Appreciate that. Um, um, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm going to try to pull up uh, PowerPoints here. Just, uh, Kathy, if you confirm verbally if it comes up okay when I get the uh, slideshow going. Perfect. It's, uh, full, full screen now. Okay. Beautiful. So yeah. I'm going to continue with uh, some of the discussion from from Monday night, uh, mainly. Uh, Talking about uh, you know system commissioning and testing and you know we we talked about documentation and the critical elements of system documentation that are so important to that to uh, you know make sure there's a good set of plans that people have to to review later on as they might troubleshoot or maintain or test that system. Uh, I'm going to uh, go pull up the IEC standard and, and show you a few things in there. Uh, some of the tests that are done, some of the you know, the, the standards that they, they developed there for that that they're using a lot in, in Europe now. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about IV measurements and, and test equipment, and mainly um, I think it will be a good review of IV curves and some of the basic performance uh, 
uh, you know, parameters of, of modules and how they're used. Um, for a lot of you, maybe you know, be sitting for the test this week that uh, uh, will help you. Uh, you know, there's definitely going to be some questions on those sorts of things. Uh, a little bit on performance and energy measurements. Uh, some other topics. Bring up one thing from the other night. If uh, gentleman's still on that had some questions about uh, magnetic declination, I have a couple slides on that. So there's. Um, We'll go ahead and get started here, and uh, we can probably, uh, probably skip over this slide here just to kind of our advanced organizer, organize our thinking about the, uh, the system we're dealing with and the power energy flows throughout the system. Now, on this uh, IEC standard again, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a document that's uh, for testing, commissioning, the documentation requirements for grid connected PV systems. It doesn't deal with standalone systems. Um, it, it's not a performance uh, verification standard in the sense that it's you know trying to verify performance ratings for systems or verify energy performance. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. It's more or less verifying electrical safety and, and that, that the nominal voltage and current parameters are within standards. Um, so I'm going to pull up a little bit of that right now here. I'm going to cut over there and just kind of take you through a few of the, uh, let's see if we got, is that standard up there now, Kathy, or did I need to share that as well? Okay. Let's see, is that, is that up now? Uh, take some time. When you switch back to the PowerPoint, it's going to take just a second here, but it did come up last time. It was the IEC thing was up a second ago. Uh, right now it's not. There we go. You're up. It's up now. Okay. There we go. Yep. So basically, this this is the uh, table of contents for the standard that uh, you know covers all the documentation requirements here. That's uh, all the basic system data, system information, all that we covered uh, Monday. Uh, all of the wiring details and so forth. Uh, data sheets for the major components, standard kinds of stuff that, that everyone puts in their documentation packages here. It just kind of outlines the requirements very specifically. Uh, mechanical design information, the structural aspects, operating maintenance information, test results and commissioning are to be part of that as well. And then they get into the actual uh, visual inspections, uh, you know, different things that uh, need to be verified. Mostly it's code verifications, the things that we talked about on Monday, verifying NEC compliance. Uh, a lot of the uh, the testing ultimately is going to verify some of the, in this case, the International Electrical Code, IEC Electrical Code requirements. Um, here's the different tests that they have, the polarity test, the string open circuit, short circuit, functional test, insulation resistance test, a couple different ways to do that that I'm going to cover real quickly. And then they've got model verification certificates that this standard has been complied with for a system installation. So that's kind of a, I don't know, a quality seal or something if you're able to do these kinds of tests and, and produce the test reports. You can kind of put a gold ribbon on the on the on uh, on that system to verify that it's it's tested and passed this, this standard, and that might mean something in terms of value to the customers and might be value-added things that the uh, installers can offer. So here's the they got a model inspection report and a PV array test report in there as well, um, and then some other stuff in the back. I mentioned infrared imaging and stuff. They talk about that, trying to identify hot spots within arrays. Some of these are pretty advanced things. You have to have thermal imaging cameras and so forth to try to you know find faults and diodes and cable connections and failures in bus bars internal to modules and things like that that are that may not show up for, for quite a while until it burns through the module or something. So uh, in, in the standard here, I want to just take you over to the, uh, move these over a little bit. Here's the, the, the testing sections here, you know, polarity test, continuity of the, uh, what we call protective earthing, equipotential bonding conductor, that's the equipment grounding uh, system there, verifying the continuity of that across all the mechanical, well, any kind of metallic equipment in the system, raceways, and so forth. The polarity test, string open circuit voltage test. One of the things you'll note here, they're looking for um, 
you know, they kind of say systems with multiple identical strings should be under stable radiance, and they're looking for, you know, within 5% of the, uh, of the uh, you know, value on the, on, the, on the open circuit voltage measurement. Same thing with the current. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to normalize or translate, you know, the, the measurements uh, made at one sunlight temperature level to a different one. This is a pretty common thing that needs to be done to, you know, in performance verification. You're going to get questions like this on the NAVSEP exam. So we'll go through a few of those things on how to actually translate current measurements or string current measurements and, you know, to a standard test condition or, you know, peak sun condition that you can compare with the nameplate labels. Short circuit current test, then they've got the test procedure, you know, outlined. They've got operational test, functional test, determine the system, you know, disconnects from the grid if the grid's de-energized and so forth. And then the insulation resistance testing, which is applying high voltage across the arrays. And uh, there's two methods. They test between the array negative and, and ground, essentially, or between a short-circuited array and, uh, and, and ground. So either between the array negative and positive cable to ground independently or between the shorted array to ground. So you need an appropriate, you know, short-circuiting device to handle that kind of thing to short-circuit the array. And they got the test procedures here. Now, this is one thing I want to mention real quick if you get ground faults in arrays. It may not be readily visible where, you know, where that fault is. It could be a visible wiring problem where the wire got nicked and it's pinched under something, you know, screw ran into it or something like that. But uh, a lot of cases it's going to be really tough to find these, things, especially in bigger arrays that don't have any string level monitoring. Uh, you know, you could be out there forever trying to find a, a faulted string. Um, and so this is what insulation resistance testing could be used for is, is to, you know, basically put high voltage across each source circuit and you're looking for, you know, very low insulation resistance would indicate faults in that in that system. And if you really want to try to pinpoint things that might only you know, a lot of these faults and stuff in the rays, they only are exacerbated when it when it rains and when the rays wet. And um, you can do wet insulation resistance testing on arrays by spraying these things down with a surfactant solution basically, you know, helps the conductivity and, and you can actually, if you've got faulted arrays, you put a thousand volts across it. You can see the flash over the arcing between, you know, between the faults and the uh, and the grounded members and stuff. So you have to do appropriate safety precautions, high voltage gloves, and all that kind of stuff when you're when you're doing those kinds of tests. So uh, here's some of the uh, test methods. What they're looking for, if your system voltage is, you know, between 120 and 500, which most of our, you know, systems are. You put 500 volts to it. it's over 500. You put 1,000 volts to the to the strings, and you're basically looking for a threshold of, of a mega ohm. It's, and usually it's going to be much much higher than that. Um, many many tens, if not hundreds of mega ohms for new new arrays. But if older arrays, uh, you know, that maybe have modules that have delaminated and things, you're going to find you know have fairly low insulation resistance. So this is a pass fail criteria essentially that they've got for that. And then here's the verification reports, lastly, that talk about, um, you know, here's a verification certificate, you know, that the installer would issue. Then um, they've got the uh, inspection report, which, you know, the frequency obviously depends on how important that application is. Uh, you know, if it's, a, if you, you know, if you have monitoring, you find out the system's not working properly and it's a big system, you, you're probably losing a lot of, value in that in that project, but smaller applications may not require that as you know as frequent maintenance. The value of energy that's produced isn't that great in those cases. So but um you go through and they've got the, the checklist here similar to our code checklist and then here's the PVRA test report. And as I mentioned last night, you know there's a couple of companies, Seaward Group in UK makes a piece of test equipment that'll do all these tests. Uh, one instrument will measure all these parameters and actually store that data in the instrument and produce it, output it to a standard test report format. So you'll see more and more of that stuff, uh, as well as the inverters being able to do this stuff. So let me uh, let me bump back over to PowerPoint here. And I uh, want to talk about IV measurements on arrays. So if you, if you have faults in arrays, obviously, you know, insulation resistance testing is, is the way to go to find find those problems. Uh, wet insulation resistance will help pinpoint those locations if you're spraying it down while you're, you know, have high voltage on 
on it, you'll see a, a market decrease in the insulation resistance. Um, but in terms of the uh, other kinds of tests that you might do on arrays are obviously the current voltage curves and measurements, and there's some inexpensive test equipment out there now that allows you to do this, to do diagnostics, and I think this will serve as a good review for folks that are getting ready to take the, take the test. So let me get this PowerPoint back up here if that's not already. Um, let's see here. How that work? Is that PowerPoint back up, Kathy? Yep, you're good to go. PowerPoint's back up? Okay. Good. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of things we can do with IV measurements, obviously, we can we can determine true maximum power points, we can get the you know short circuit, open circuit, all those parameters. Uh, we can see the effects of degradation, uh, increases in resistance, uh, series or shunt resistance. We can see uh, effects of shading, soiling. A lot of things can, can be done by, you know, measuring the IV curves. Um, <coughs> excuse me. What I wanted to do here is just kind of go over the basic IV parameters, and you know, for those of you guys sitting for the NAPSEP test, you're going to have to know this stuff. Um, it's a uh, it's a typical module nameplate label with all the rated specifications. Uh, we're going to look at them on the IV curve. This is actually required in Article 69051 of the National Electrical Code that all modules have this label information because these are the these are the data that you're using in the calculations, the code calculations. Um, the uh, open circuit voltage will be to, used to determine maximum system voltage. <laughs> the rated voltage will be used to determine operating voltage ranges and in inverters. The short circuit current is going to be used to determine maximum currents and size conductors and overcurrent protection. Uh, all the equipment in the system, rated voltage, uh, operating maximum voltage will be used to determine voltage ratings for all the equipment as well. And then you and then you gotta recognize that this is at standard test conditions at a thousand watts per square meter, twenty five degrees Celsius temperature of the of the module. And we can translate these data to other conditions. We know that, that the current varies linearly with, with sunlight and the, the voltage varies with uh, temperature primarily. Um other information on here that the label, you know, this is uh good for up to six hundred volts. In the U.S., for, for European applications, they can go to 1,000. It's fire rated Class C, meaning it, it can be installed on a building. Modules that don't have a fire class rating can't be installed on buildings. Maximum series fuse requirement, 15 amps. That's going to be a key thing. Can't have anything larger than a 15 amp fuse. Got to be at least, uh, you know, at least big enough to protect the uh, conductor uh, and 156% and of the short circuit current, but no bigger than 15 amps. You've got copper size wire, 90 degree C wire, typically going to be PV wire, USC2. The listing, double insulated wire is shown on here, um, what the two squares are. It's uh, listed the UL1703 plus. It's additionally certified uh, for design qualification tests, the IEC61215. So that's uh, additional reliability testing that the modules go through to prove their, their 25 year warranty. And, and rely long term reliability. So um these are all parameters, you know, that, that we have to work with. If they give you a problem that said, you know, how many of these modules could you put in series, uh, for example, and not exceed the maximum of six hundred volts, you know, you'd have to look at the open circuit voltage and correct for lowest temperature and all the same kind of things you do for inverter string sizing. So very important to understand all this information and, and how to use it. Um Here's the basic IV curve you'll see from you know, manufacturers uh, that actually identify these points. So you know, you're gonna need, you need to know where these, these points are, occur on the IV curve, short circuit current. That's the open circuit voltage down here, maximum power point, maximum current. Wherever the largest rectangle area that we can draw between corresponding voltage and current points is gonna be the maximum power point. It's gonna be on the knee of the IV curve. So the area 
of that rectangle actually defines the maximum power because one side of that rectangle is the voltage, the other side is the current. So that's uh, one way to look at it. So uh, here's uh, another way to represent an IV curve by plotting power versus voltage. You can clearly see where the maximum power point is. We plot power on this uh, right axis, voltage on the x-axis current over here. So here's the traditional IV curve. This is the power versus voltage curve. Same thing. It's just uh, represented a little differently. Uh, a lot of stuff comes up about efficiency. You know, people think that higher, you know, you know, higher efficiency modules are better for some reason in terms of, you know, uh, cost or whatever, or they're better, better to have. I think, uh, you know, what people don't understand is efficiency of a PV device is an area-related, you know, concern. It doesn't really uh, doesn't have anything to do with cost. Actually, higher efficiency cells usually cost more. Um, it's essentially the rated, you know, electrical power output divided by the solar radiance input uh, over over the given area. And so this is a pretty standard calculation, and this is all going to be related to surface area of arrays that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, in estimating, you know, how much array can you put in a given size area, you know, rules of thumb for that. So here's a here's an example. We've got a PV module that's uh, 1.4 square meters and it produces 200 watts. Well, it's exposed to uh, peak sun, 1,000 watts per square meter. And the output's 200 watts. It's got 1,000 watts per square meter input times 1.4 square meters area. It comes out of 14.3%. So that's typical typical PV module. That's probably right off a of manufacturer's data sheet. So that's, uh, you know, even though they may not report the efficiency with the numbers, that's that's essentially what it means. It just means you're going to be able to get more higher power density, more watts per square foot. Uh, usually, you know, space-constrained applications, pole mounts, trackers, you know, residential buildings and stuff have more constraints on area than, than obviously field, you know, applications or large commercial buildings and stuff, you know, might not need as, as high efficient of a product that, uh, and so forth. But um, we'll talk about how, what affects, you know, where you operate on the IV curve and, and you know, the, 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 the electrical load that you connect to a PV device, a PV cell or a module or an array, that's what determines where you're going to operate on that IV curve because that IV curve represents an infinite number of operating points you know, between basically zero load, resistance is zero, short circuit condition, and all the way up to an infinite load, R is equal to infinity, which is an open circuit voltage condition. So you can operate anywhere between there. Obviously, we want to operate at the peak power point uh, to know, you know, uh, to obviously to extract the maximum efficiency out of that module. So fortunately, maximum power point trackers do that for us, but in, in terms of the fundamentals, you know, if a battery is connected to a PV device, that's what sets the operating voltage for the PV module. Uh, and uh, if it's a maximum power point tracker, that's going to load it differently. So if we look at, uh, you know, these series of rectangles, this rectangle would indicate an operating point up here on the IV curve. Can, can, can we see the mouse there, Kathy? We've got some circle in the data point there, so. Yes, yeah, uh, everything's going great. Okay, and uh, essentially that area of that rectangle defines how much power you're extracting from that IV curve by operating at that particular point right there that I'm circling. And as we as we increase the operating voltage on the IV curve, obviously the rectangle gets bigger now, so we're extracting more power out of the out of the module. There's another one, you know, and until we get to this point, that's where our biggest rectangle is. Now, if we go to the right of that point, we go back down here. That, that voltage is higher than this maximum power point up here, now the rectangle gets smaller area, and, and that means less power is being extracted from the module. So where we want to be is right here. This is the maximum power point, and that defines the maximum power current, maximum power voltage. This is where we're going to operate uh, when we're tracking maximum power points. So that's the largest area of the rectangle we can, we can draw there. So we got a battery hooked to the uh, PV module. Here's a here's some IV curves that would represent. Uh, this might be a uh, PV module with 30 cells in series, 36 silicon cells in series, and 42 cells. So 
It's just basically the same type of cell, same current output, same size cell, but we've got 30, 36, and 42 in series, so we got a little bit higher up in circuit voltage with, with the other two. And what I've shown here is like the range of typical op battery voltage from maybe 11, 11 and a half to 14 and a half volts up here would be typical range to operate charging a 12 volt lead acid battery. Um, and what we can see at the, uh, if we look at the operating voltage over the range relative to the, the light blue IV curve, which is the 30 cells in series, uh, we've essentially got, uh, as the voltage increases across that battery voltage range, what happens to the current? It goes down. The current decreases as the as the voltage increases, and at, at fully charged battery voltage, we're only accepting half of the current that the array is capable of producing closer to max power point. So, obviously, temperature is going to affect voltage, reduce module voltage, and we got to, usually going to have to have 36 cells in series. The green line represents the typical standard. So 36 cells in series to charge a 12 volt battery. That's why a lot of the modules went from 36 to 72 cells uh, when they when they got bigger. And now the cells are bigger, they're moving back to 60 cell modules. But uh, the operating points up here, what you can see is over that entire battery voltage range, we're operating to the left of the IV or the maximum power point, and and the current doesn't taper off that much. We're getting full current in over that entire battery voltage range. So this is a kind of a key thing in matching, you know, batteries or PV arrays to batteries for proper charging voltage. Unless we're using a max power point track and charge controller where we configure the array a lot higher voltages, um, you know, you have to make sure the open the max power voltage at highest operating temperature is going to be, you know, greater than that, that fully charged battery voltage or else you're going to lose a lot of current cap uh, charging current capability as you start to drop off the knee of the IV curve. So, uh, just kind of wanted to demonstrate that. Now, in terms of the electrical load, again, if we uh, zero resistance, we're at the short circuit current point. We're shorting the module out, which is, doesn't harm the PV module. Can damage the connectors if you short circuit a module and the connectors are not rated for load break. Then you'll burn the connectors. So you have to have another short circuiting device to, to do that. It's rated for the current. Um, Here's infinite resistance, open circuit voltage. And as you increase the load resistance, you're going to basically operate at different points on the IV curve as that resistance increases up to infinity. And that's one of the methods you can use to measure IV curves on modules. You can just essentially look at where the load. So if you, if you tell me the maximum power point, let's look at an example here that uh, we've got, you know, say a maximum power point of a, of a uh, current and, and voltage for PV module are 4.89 and 35.8 volts, respectively. You know, what's the maximum power? What's the load resistance? Well, the power is obviously just the product of those those two voltages and current. And then, you know, from Ohm's law, you just take the uh, voltage divided by current is equal to the load resistance. So, if you took 35.8 volts divided by the 4.89 amps, that gives you the 7.3 ohms that. Uh, you would need to, to load that module up. That obviously has to be a load that can handle 175 watts. Uh, but a 7, 7 ohm, 7.3 ohm load is going to load that module at maximum power under those conditions. So that's uh, kind of a little exercise and, and you know, an application for Ohm's law. Now here's a typical circuit for testing, you know, PV PV devices, voltmeter in parallel, ammeter. In series, you know, we can use a variable resistor. We can use a bipolar power supply or a, a battery. We could put a two, four, six volt battery on it, so forth like that, and measure different points on the IV curve. Or we could use electronic load with MOSFET transistors, or we could use an electrolytic capacitor to quickly charge up and measure IV data points with a high speed data acquisition system. And here's some equipment that's, that's out there. This is the new Solmetric PVA 600 PV analyzer. This is a portable. IV tracer, it's something like 2,500 bucks. They've got wireless. Um, they've got a wireless sensor for solar radiation and temperature. Uh, several temperature measurements are all connected, and then you can you have a little computer that you you know that's not provided by them, but you that's the wireless uh, card in the top there. And you know, the guy should probably have gloves on if he's testing live circuits. That's kind of a little little issue there as far as safety, but. Um, 
probably can't work his computer very well doing that either. So, but that's uh, it's a very portable unit. You can see the size of it relative to the to the guy there, and and uh, you know that's uh, kind of an advanced diagnostic tool. Here's a little bit more uh, expensive one. These things are about twenty five thousand. There's a uh, DS100 curve tracer good up to 600 volts and 100 amp arrays uh, interfaces with a, a PC and so forth and it, it's a capacitive loading curve tracer. Then I guess if you want to go all the way up, here's a indoor simulator where you lay PV modules down on there. It's a uh, Spire single long pulse flash simulator. It's got two xenon arc, arc flash lamps underneath the uh, the bed there. And, is uh, intended to do indoor measurements of, uh, of PV modules and so forth. That's at, at Florida Solar Energy Center there. Uh, some of the things that IV curves can tell for you that, that, that you know, what we talked about earlier, you know, increasing resistance in the circuit, bad connections in, in the source circuits. Uh, you're going to see a bigger slope in the IV curve at the near the open circuit voltage point as series resistance increases in the circuit due to bad connections, due to, you know, burn up uh, wires or, you know, smaller than, than necessary conductors if you have a lot of voltage drop in the system. Essentially, this is how series resistance is going to change the shape of an IV curve. So anything that, that adds resistance between the modules or the string and, and where you're making the measurement. Um, shunt resistance is kind of indicative of problems internal to modules that uh, would indicate changing slopes up by the short circuit current point. As you get bigger slopes up there and, and reductions in, in open circuit voltage, that's, that means you get lower shunt resistance. That means you've got internal problems in modules that tend to develop. And of course, shading issues are going to show up as big bumps in the IV curve. You're going to see basically discontinuities where you're going to, you know, partial shading is going to show up as big, big bumps and things like that when you're doing individual modules and, and strings. So something else IV curves can give you an idea what what's happening. Now, just a quick review on, you know, response to solar radiance. This is very fundamental, very important to be able to do quickly the translations between one, the radiance condition and another. Manufacturers are going to rate their products at 1,000 watts per square meter. It's a simple linear translation to correct from one sunlight level to another. Um, here's a uh, you know, it just shows from, you know, going from 500 to 1,000 watts per square meter, it doubles the current, essentially. So it's, uh, while voltage stays pretty much the same for open circuit voltage, back power voltage stays pretty much the same as well. So this is very fundamental things to know for the NAPSEP exam. Um, uh, here's another relationship that shows open circuit voltage, um, how it comes up very quickly and stays pretty constant throughout the day, whereas current varies linearly with, with sunlight level. So as you get towards solar noon and peak sunlight level and arrays, maximum current, and it varies linearly with, with the solar radiation intensity on the array. So here's some quick, you know, examples of how, you know, we have PV modules, 200 watt module, under peak sun, 1,000 watts per square meter. Assuming constant temperature, what's the power output going to be at, at 600? Well, it's just 60% of that. So it's uh, 120 watts. So you can do this for the current or the power are both directly proportional to the solar radiance level. And, and guarantee you're going to have some questions on that set test that are going to relate to this. Um, now, temperature response is another thing that, that's really important relative to string sizing and Building building PV arrays for the proper operating voltages, and as, as we increase operating temperatures on PV modules, we we have lower operating voltages. Okay, so PV module is cold is a lot higher voltage than when it's hot, and so we have to make sure we don't exceed maximum voltages for equipment and burgers of that nature. When the module is at its coldest operating temperature, we got to make sure the voltage is high enough. Make sure it's high enough when the thing's hot in the middle of the summer, operating during the day. So. Um, the temperature coefficients are what define the changing voltage or current power with changing temperature. And this question came up um, Monday. Uh, you're going to see questions like this on the on the NAVSEP test. And there's basically two ways the coefficients are re represented. You have percentage change coefficients, which are the most easy to understand that we're going to talk about. You have absolute coefficients that say, well, the module voltage changes so many millivolts, you know, 
170 millivolts per degree C or something like that. And then you have to apply that to however many modules you have in series and and so forth, and make sure you understand that that what that coefficient is for a cell or a module, um, you know, per degree C, and you just apply it that way. But in the percentage basis, this is a fairly easy way to understand. Is uh, you know, for silicon crystalline uh, you know products, poly and single crystal, you know, coefficients are pretty typical. Minus uh, four tenths of a percent per degree C, meaning voltage decreases about a percent for every two and a half degree increase in temperature. So you go up 10 degrees C, voltage is going to decrease by 4%. And so that's very easy to tell, you know, I mean, very easy to, to think about it in that in that respect. So you know, if you go out to an array and, and you know, this nameplate voltage at 25 degrees C is 500 volts, and you go out there and it's 50 degrees C operating temperature on the array, and that's 25 degrees C difference, um, you're going to expect, uh, about a 10% reduction in that voltage, or that array is going to be really operating around 450 volts and not 500 volts, um, you know, according to the spec. So, very easy to do those calculations at the top of your head. The next page, I got some examples of just, the, you know, the basic equation. Basically, the temperature difference between the reference condition, that's usually going to be 25 degrees C, and there's your cell temperature, and there's your coefficient of voltage or power. Power is about negative four and a half percent. So the coefficients are negative, so you got a negative sign in here. Usually that temperature differential is going to be negative if you're talking about increasing, um, uh, well, talk about lower temperature, it's going to be negative and it's going to wind up adding to the voltage, the reference voltage or the reference power. So here's a quick example. We got a 72 cell crystalline silicon module, 44.4 volts at 25 degrees C, and it's got 0.33 temperature coefficient. Um, that's actually from Solar World. That's a little bit lower than the 0.4, negative 0.4 percent that's used in Table 690.7 in the code book. But uh, you get about the same result, you know, if you use this, if, if you use the uh, if you use the negative 0.4. Um, but here's the reference voltage, and we're basically taking the reference voltage and adding or subtracting the results of this. Uh, this part of the equation, we're looking at a temperature difference between 60 and 25 at 35 degrees. There's the, we multiply that by the coefficient, okay, we multiply it by the voltage, and everything in those brackets turns out to be negative 5 volts, roughly. So now that, that 44 volt module really op is operating at 39 volts. Now, if that same module operated at negative 10 degrees C, which it, it will in a very cold day in the middle of the winter up, up north uh, early in the morning, it's uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be five volts higher than the rated voltage of 44 volts. It's going to be like closer to 50 volts, 49.6 volts here. So that's a quick example. Just you know, recognize that if something's hotter, it's going to be a lower voltage and lower power. Um, the temperature coefficients and uh, for voltage and power are negative. Um, here's one for the power. Uh, same calculation. We're taking a 50 kilowatt PV system that's operating. Um, with a power coefficient of negative 0.45%, it's operating at 50 degrees C. It's actually that 50 kilowatt system is going to produce more like 44 kilowatts. And if it's operating under, you know, at, at very cold conditions, it's got to be well below zero outside for it to be producing that during the middle of the day. Uh, it'd have to be like minus 20 degrees C ambient or something. Um, but you know, it would produce more power than the rated power under those conditions. So, last couple of things here. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. About another 20 minutes, and then we can take some questions. Uh, we'll talk quickly about verified DC and AC power output and, 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 and things from the other day that uh, we kind of touched on and didn't get into much. Uh, you know, the, the reason we measure stuff on PV systems is to verify things, to verify expected performance. So you have to have an understanding of what to expect, you know, before you make a measurement, know whether it's good or bad, uh, or you need to do something else after you make the measurement. So good thing is the inverters do a lot of this for us, uh, but it's important to know, you know, what these measurements are and what they mean and how to use that information, uh, particularly for, you know, the troubleshooting kinds of things where you have to use your mind and think about things and think about, well, what's going on? What's causing that problem? And, and how do I, you know, how do I solve it? What, what's the systematic process? You know, it's like the floor mopping routine. Do you start in the middle and 
just kind of scatter around and mop the floor. You start in the corner and start figuring out, you know, do it systematically and so forth. And that's kind of, you know, the troubleshooting process is to kind of be able to hone that down and, and to, to really, you know, do some of the basic things and understanding these basic parameters and all is kind of key to that. Um, you know, here's some quickly just some of the stuff SMA does with their monitoring just from a couple of years ago. And it's just an incredible amount of stuff these inverters can do, you know, up to send you SMS messages, you know, text messages on your cell phone and stuff. So uh, when you, you know, based on whether your inverter's throwing an error code and, you know, kind of web interfaces and multiple inverter interfaces and all kind of consumer displays, a lot of sophisticated stuff with these inverters, and it's going to get more sophisticated. In fact, as I mentioned Monday, a lot of a lot of PV companies are hiring IT guys, uh, you know, computer computer guys, just to handle their data acquisition needs and monitoring. So, main things that we're monitoring for performance, uh, you know, obviously this is going to be the first key. See, performance goes down, that's going to indicate other problems that need to be investigated. Um, you know, simple interactive systems, you're going to measure power output and you're going to measure energy production over time and you know, standalone systems are a lot more complex. I mean, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of power flows in different directions, and you basically got to measure net amp hours in and out of the battery to determine, you know, if the battery's, you know, being deficit charged or adequately charged, and, and measure load currents and uh, you know, time time of use and things like that. So it's a little bit more sophisticated, more circuits. Now, one of the simple ways to measure power is just something that a lot of people, you know, do with, uh, you know, if you want to get an average power for any branch circuit in a building, you just turn off everything but that branch circuit or, or that particular load, and you can use the standard utility kilowatt hour meter. Uh, use the watt hour constant, which is that K sub H number, that 7.2 number in this case on this meter. Most residential meters are about that. And uh, measure the revolution rate of the disk. And if you multiply the watt hour constant by the revolution rate, uh, that's going to give you the uh, the average power that's flowing through the meter over that interval. So the disks on the meters are all marked zero to hundred. And even if you have uh, electronic meters, the the hash marks, the little LCD hash marks that progress across the screen when the meters, you know, passing power, those are simulating a disk revolution. And you can do the same thing and determine the power flow. You see a stopwatch and measure how many revolutions of the disk per minute or however many per 10 seconds, and then we're going to run a little calculation here. The, the watt hours per revolution is what that case of H is. And if you know how many revolutions per, per minute, uh, per, per uh, hour, essentially, that's, that's going to give you the power flow through the meters. So uh, a lot of PV inverters have dedicated utility meters separate from the inverter monitoring uh, that can, you know, you can verify the, the inverter power rating or the power monitoring features with these external meters as well. Here's an electronic meter. Um, now verifying the, the power output and trying to understand whether it's consistent with your expectation kind of follows the way we, you know, go through energy performance estimates. But, um, you know, if, if we're looking at DC power rating of, a, of an array at, at 10 kilowatts, for example, We've got a number of D rating factors. One is, is the nameplate rating of the manufacturer accurate? You know, I'm giving them 5% there, so I'm throwing 5% away right out the bat. I'm saying inverter transformer efficiency, 95% is pretty typical. Module mismatch and DC wiring, AC wiring losses, I'm throwing in a few percent there. Um, soiling on the array, I'm going to say there's no soiling. I'm going to say there's no age degradation. Uh, obviously, this is for the power. You wouldn't do this with any shading factors or anything like that in here. So we're about 86% of that 10 kilowatts is what we expect just based on the, you know, just based on these these de normal derating factors. Now we're going to do temperature adjustment. We use a negative half percent per degree C, and it's operating at 60 degrees C. Then that that array is only going to put out seven kilowatts now instead of 10 kilowatts. That's just that's uh, that's on the AC side now. That would be on the output of the inverter. Okay, if the measure solar radiance was 850 on the array, sorry, then that, that 10 kilowatt DC rated PV array, nameplate rating on the array, it, you know, it may be only producing as high as 6 or 7 kilowatts AC due to these factors. So this is, 
you just plug in the, you know, your own numbers to this sort of simple estimation, you should be able to verify, you know, within five percent or so that the, you know, AC power output of a system is doing what it's supposed to be doing based on the nameplate rating of the system. AC energy production, uh, we do that with PV watts. It, it's uh, there's additional derating factors that we're going to include. But similar ones from the power estimate. We're going to have shading factors here, obviously, in, in longer term energy production. Um, one thing I wanted to get back to, and it's kind of out of place here, but you know, array area calculations, it should have been back with efficiency talk earlier, but um, you know, to determine the power density of a module, how many watts per square foot, uh, it's, just, it's just basically taking the module rated power output divided by the, the, the surface area of that module. And uh, here's, you know, lower efficiency stuff, maybe 6%, 15% or higher. Uh, you know, that kind of translates almost into, into watts per square foot. Um, here, take an example, 175-watt module is 14 square feet. That's 12 watts per square foot. About 10 watts per square foot is typically, you know, a benchmark for what people determine, uh, you know, a power density of a completed array is going to be once you have spacing for rails and all that kind of stuff in between walkways and and whatnot. Uh, so if you take a four kilowatt PV array, total module area is like 400, uh, 328 square feet, and, and that's that's essentially like 10 sheets of plywood is what that amounts to, uh, to give you an idea of the, of the surface area. So that fit on most houses, and you know, it's kind of a, a quick benchmark of. Uh, kind of using the efficiency numbers we talked about earlier. Um, and here's a quick example of, um, you know, here's a rooftop installation. That's actually a real real installation out in L.A. And it's a commercial building, warehouse. Um, it's got half a, half a megawatt system on the roof. The total surface area of that building is 100,000 square feet. It's like a big box retail. And uh, if you cover 50% of that array area, with PV, allowing for spaces between, for shading, obviously there's a tilted rack arrays, uh, spacing between the air handling equipment and so forth. You know, turns out that, that you're getting about, you know, uh, a kilowatt per 100 square feet or, or, you know, 100 watts per square foot is, is kind of what you're, what you're covering up on this thing in terms of the, the power density. Here's another example where, you know, you might be doing a site survey, pull up some digital, some satellite imagery of a building. Um, you look at the size, there's a 100,000 square foot building again. You, you draw some PV arrays in there where they might go. Um, you know, you kind of look at the uh, roughly 50% of that roof area again. If you cover 50% of that up, that's pretty much like, that's a Home Depot, that's a light like commercial retail. They don't have any equipment in there other than lighting and air conditioning. So they pretty much meet the energy needs in that building on that basis. So here's some other tools to look at. Look at PV watts. Uh, look at in my backyard. That's a uses a, a Google Earth interface. Or you can do simple back of the napkin calculations and estimate energy. But these are kind of the long-term things you want to be verifying with system energy performance through monthly or semi-annual or annual meter readings to kind of determine. Well, did this, you know, did this system produce as much energy as uh, on an annual basis as we uh, estimated that it would, you know, when we did the uh, proposal to the customer? So here's here's a estimating energy production. It's the same thing PV Watts does. It's just a simple spreadsheet, but it does it on an, it rather than a an hour by hour basis like PV Watts does. It's just taking an average daytime operating temperature for the array, so something like 40, 45 which is kind of what the PTC rating in California is more, more representative of is an average daytime rating or uh, better to use that for estimating long, you know, overall energy production. So here's some results from PV watts, so forth, just some of the screens you get from it. In my backyard, what it gives you in terms of outputs. Uh, so those are really useful tools, both public domain, free, free charge. Uh, lastly, uh, I don't know if a uh, gentleman's here from the other night that had a question on magnetic declination. This is uh, basically, I just had two slides here. Hopefully we'll take any questions people have, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, you probably get a question like this on the NAPSAP test. It's, it's, you know, this is the angle between true geographic north and magnetic north pole, and it's, uh, it, it varies. Uh, mainly with, with longitude.
latitude and, 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 and you know, gets more extreme up, up in the northern latitudes and so forth. This doesn't have anything to do with solar declination, no, no relationship whatsoever to solar declination uh, other than it's in balsam angles, but uh, nothing to, to do. And, and essentially, in the western U.S. has positive de declination. They call it easterly declination, too. So if you're in the western U.S., your magnetic compass needle is going to point right or west, east of, of uh, true, true geographic north due to the magnetic field influence. Just the opposite on the eastern coast in the eastern U.S., you have negative or westerly declination. That, mag that magnetic compass needle is going to point basically towards the west uh, of, of actual true geographic north. And so here's just a, a map of the magnetic declination for the U.S. It's essentially zero up through the Mississippi River Delta um, in, in Valley. And it's uh, as you go east, it's particularly in the northeast, it gets greater, so you get 15, 20 percent error in a magnetic compass reading as you get into the New England area. Um, and same thing when you get up into the Northeast uh, Pacific area. So um, here's just the uh, <laughs> you know an example of what what happens uh, you know if you were in the Western U.S. as positive recently declination magnetic North Pole is going to be uh, actually to the east of, of true geographic north, and this is uh, just what you make on the uh, solar pathfinder, for example. <laughs> so that's all I have. We'll take take a few questions, Kathy, I guess. And, uh, if we have any. I don't see. People can email my emails up there. So they can email me if they have any questions. I got a few emails after the last one. So. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know if this catches you off guard. It really wasn't your topic tonight, but uh, I know one of the types of troubleshooting we had that Bakersfield fire and we, you know, ground faults and arc faults are something. Maybe you could shed just a couple of your insights on that. Sure. Um, you know, so I think this is kind of emphasizing the importance of testing these systems routinely, you know, not only at the time of installation, but routinely over their lifetime. <clears throat> you know, especially these systems on commercial buildings that, you know, can burn the building down and so forth. So, um, you know, if there was routine types of testing done on those systems, they would have been able to find those problems before they before they wound up melting the arrays down through the building. So, um, you know, there's a lot of change that's going to happen with the, with the electrical code here in 2014, probably more than has ever happened um, in terms of changes or proposals in to uh, make all PV arrays ungrounded and use all ungrounded uh, inverters. And, and, and for the purposes of being able to do better fault detection, um, I think that's uh, they, there's a new requirement for arc fault uh, detection uh, in PV systems. It's not presently available with any equipment uh, in the 2011 code. That's uh, you know that's obviously motivating the, the inverter manufacturers to include that capability in their in their inverters. But DC arc faults are a hard thing to uh, to, to measure and differentiate between DC disconnects and normal things that happen in, in circuits. So there's uh, Quite a bit of work going on in that area um, with the, with the code and standards and with the inverter manufacturers. I think we're going to see a lot more uh, monitoring from um, you know um, uh, you know from the inverter standpoint of doing pre startup diagnostics in the morning to measure insulation resistance, determine if there's any arc faults or ground faults before it actually starts up, and probably give us better diagnostics on string level. <laughs> I mean, the technology is there to do it, and, and a lot of the larger inverters do have that capability now. So, you know, it's obviously you have a big field of array. You can't afford to send somebody out there and start pecking through it, finding the problem. They've got to, they've got to know where to go look, you know, before they get out there. Um, got a question here from Sam. Um, is, uh, where can we get that, that IEC 62446 standard? Um, you can purchase standards through IEC. Uh, you'll be able to look at some of it on this video, obviously, but it's uh, yeah, that's, you have to subscribe to the standard, I guess, and and um, purchase it 
through through IEC. It's a uh, IEC six two four four six. I, I don't think it's that much, but uh, unfortunately, uh, if I want to go on a rant here for a minute, you know, I believe that all standards that are enforced, uh, you know, like the National Electrical Code, to become law, essentially. Uh, you shouldn't charge people for those kinds of things. We get all of our OSHA standards for free. Any statutes in any state or the Code of Federal Regulations or any of that stuff's all free. And then we got to pay for these certain laws, and these companies make a lot of money writing them, writing those books. So uh, it's just kind of a beef. I think we should give away the National Electrical Code for free too. So unfortunately, we've got to pay for them right now. Um, Sarah has a question here. Uh, TV wire the same thing as THWN2. No, no, it's not. It's uh, THWN2 is a standard uh, building wire uh, that is not sunlight resistant. Uh, it's it's wet rated, uh, heat resistant, nylon jacketed insulation. That's what the THWN stands for. Um, and um, the hyphen two means that that conductor will maintain its 90 degree C temperature rating, whether it's wet or dry. Meaning, if it's an outdoors and it's in conduit outdoors, it's a wet location. It'll still be a 90 degree C conductor, and you can use the 90 degree C opacity rating for that that wire, that size wire at, at, at 90 degree C. So, but the THW two conductor, Sarah, it's got to be in conduit. Um, it, it cannot be exposed conductor anywhere. Or it's got to be in a cable uh, with an outer jacket of insulation. It's not sunlight resistant. It's not intended to be used outside of a raceway or, or conduit. PV wire now is actually a double insulated wire that's available up to 2,000 volt listing. It's the standard wire that comes on the whips, on the on the connectors on PV modules, uh, pretty much from all the manufacturers now. Uh, it's intended to be used with these. Uh, Higher voltage systems. It's intended to be used with these ungrounded arrays that require double insulated cables uh, that are going to be exposed uh, behind PV modules in those systems. Um, and, and you don't have to have PV wire in conduit as long as it's behind uh, immediately behind the array. Any transition from the wiring from an array going five feet to a junction box has got to be in a raceway. It can't be just strung across the roof. So. Uh, single individual conductor exposed wiring is only permitted for intermodule connections behind the array. It's in, I think it's in 690.31 in the, in the code book. So uh, let's see, we got kind of went on about that one. Let me uh, get back up here and see if I finished answering. The, yeah, the PV wire would only be required, you know, behind the array if you were, and, and most of the time it's just, you're not going to have to have any extra wire. You're going to transition right to some junction box right at the edge of the array or the combiner box um, to transition to your conventional wiring methods, the THWN2, for example. Um, let's see. Uh, so Kathy, you had somebody sent you something about lightning protection. Um, can you discuss? I think we might have mentioned the other Monday a little bit about uh, grounding and bonding. If you if buildings do have lightning protection systems on them, you know, and they the rays are on the roof, they have to be bonded to that lightning protection system. Um, there is a standard, uh, uh, an FPA standard. Uh, I think it's 780. It uh, deals with uh, Lighting protection systems and, and equipment, and that's uh, that's kind of a specialty area, actually. I'm, I'm not that familiar with what the requirements are, but I do know they have to be bonded to the uh, the arrays would have to be bonded to that lighting protection system. Um, the lighting protection, as far as PV systems, usually inverters or have some sort of surge protection. You can you can buy additional surge protection products uh, either for DC combiners on the AC. You know, at the point of connection in the, in the AC distribution system, you can put surge protection on there. You can buy entire house uh, surge protection uh, equipment that will go on the, uh, you know, uh, at the service or behind the meter, uh, different ways to protect against surges on, on the system. Um, but, you know, PV arrays aren't going to track lightning anything, you know, any more than anything else. Well, it's just, uh, you know, they're usually high up. Uh, if stuff gets hit, they're going to easily get hit. So uh, 
ground and bottom real good. That's that's the biggest savior there from what I can tell. We've seen a raise get hit by lightning, nothing happens to them. If they're grounded and bonded good, if they're not grounded and bonded good, the lightning's got to go somewhere. And it's going to find ground at some point, and then hopefully that's not through something that might be damaged. Um, Sam had another question. Europe, Middle East uh, follows those IEC standards instead of NEC. Is there any document that compares the NEC standards to IEC? You know, that's a good question, Sam. And, you know, what I found looking at them is uh, the standards aren't really any different. If you, on this, uh, you know, all the checks, the checklists for the normal code compliance stuff on, uh, you know, design currents and stuff, it's all 156% of the short circuit currents, you know, for overcurrent protection and conductor sizing on the PV array source circuits, uh, requires disconnects in the same places and things like that. Uh, it's really uh, the same language, it's just that they use, you know, uh, they don't use American wire gauge sizes, they use, you know, cross-sectional areas of the wires and stuff like that. So it's uh, pretty much the same requirements. There's, uh, you know, and I think that's, uh, but the U.S. will always have the NEC, um, you know, and it's, it's, there'll be a lot of harmonization between those standards. So there's not going to fundamentally be much difference between them. Um, it's just if that, if that, you know, if, if another IEC standard is applied in the U.S., then, you know, the NEC requirements relative to that would apply. So, so we have any more uh, questions there, Kathy, or anything? Uh, Appreciate everyone's time and um, interest. Good luck on the test well, for those of you. We're at the uh, hour mark. In fact, it's about uh, two minutes after. Um, and I believe that's everything. Uh, this session, as you know, uh, is recorded. For those of you that want to check back again before the exam or let someone else know this is out there. Um, but uh, as far as I know, uh, we're all set. So um, I just want to um, thank everybody for participating in these two sessions, I mean, these six sessions, in fact, two with Jim here at the end, which was so great. Um, and look tomorrow for any new emails on any last words of wisdom. Uh, as you know, we do have a session scheduled tomorrow night at the same exact time we've been running these Monday and Thursday, uh, which would be uh, 6 o'clock Central Time. And we'll be just picking up some loose ends of things maybe to, to, to touch on um, that may have been missed. And we'll also be uh, going over some test-taking strategies that might help you with your time management as well as, you know, narrowing down the answer and, and things that can help you to, to do better. Um, so if there's any specific questions for us here at Soul Power People, please send us an email to either info at soulpowerpeople.com or rstoball at soulpowerpeople.com or bcredson at soulpowerpeople.com. Uh, we're really excited about uh, all the participation and enthusiasm. Check the forums. Check the newsletters. There's a lot of good information out there. And um, if you haven't done so already, one of the materials I recommended everybody to look at before the exam uh, there's a series of articles that uh, were written by John Wiles, published in Home Power Magazine, called Code Corner. Um, now that you've reviewed a lot of the information, sometimes having read those articles early on, they get into a high level talking about code and you may or may not have understood them. Um, but now as you get closer to the exam, uh, I remember the night before I took it, I reread all those articles and uh, really, really helped me. Also, there was a really great article called Code Red, that I was in your reading list dealing with the code changes for 2011 by Rebecca Wren and Brian Mahalik. Definitely recommend that one. And another one that was in a 2009 issue of Solifo called Can We Land that was on the interconnect connection, which also went over a lot of things and combiner boxes and other things. Um, so those are just a few last highlights if you haven't touched on those resources, as well as John Wiles' uh, suggested practices for the 2005 NEC, even though that some of the code references have been updated a couple times since. There's a lot of great installation um, advice and uh, good pictures and diagrams that are great for some di different kinds of systems. And uh, also that uh, Bill Brooks uh, CEC installation and PV design and installation uh, manual that's listed in the resources from uh, NAVSEP. So if you haven't downloaded and looked at those things, those are some real definite musts here at the quote unquote last minute you've got about a day and a half left to prepare. And um, again, Richard uh, will be logging on tomorrow at some point to go over a 
brief rundown again of the highlighted NEC. Um, you've got to know what's in there and what's not in there, uh, as well as where things are, and realize that a lot of times things are cross-referenced to various places within the code. So uh, good luck to you all, and uh, we'll be check your email for additional updates between now and the exam. And uh, if I don't see you personally, uh, I will tomorrow night, actually. So we'll see you then. Okay. That's all. Signing off. Thank okay, you, Jim. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Take care. You too. Recorder. I'm not getting it in session. You didn't give me a hosting name. Video out. And there's all.